Well, let's get started, you guys. I'm Kat Perkins. I am so excited to be doing this today. Honestly, it's COVID and I'm just, I'd like to have a reason to get out of bed and to put makeup on and I'm so excited to be here. So um, maybe some of you know this, but I was on season six of The Voice, NBC's The Voice. I was a finalist. I got fourth place that year and um, it's been exactly six years to the day, which is crazy to me. Time flies when you're having fun, for sure. Um, so I was so excited to be asked to do this today because I am a brand ambassador for Livia. Um, I have lost 30 pounds on the program, and I am in full maintenance mode. And I have uh, been on the program since September tw or May 27th of last year. So a year and a couple months into the process. And um, it's just been phenomenal to get my body back. And um, I am now exactly the weight I was when I was on NBC's The Voice six years ago. And um, anyway, I wanted to just kind of talk about uh, being fearless today. And it's something that really came up during my experience on The Voice, that word, the definition of that word. And I even wrote a song about it. And I, um, I have heard it now in the Livia commercials, which is amazing. So I'll start from kind of the beginning. Um, I grew up, I, uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota nowadays, but I actually grew up in a very tiny town called Scranton, North Dakota. I'm probably positive that nobody has heard of that before. If you have, we're probably related um, because Scranton, North Dakota is, uh, was population 280 when I grew up there. Um, I was just back not too long ago and they have about 180 people. So if you blink, you miss it. It's got one street. I grew up on Main Street for a part of my life. And then I grew up on a farm for uh, the majority of my time there. My father was the music teacher in the town. So he was my teacher and my sister was the choir teacher. So it was a very much a family affair in Scranton, North Dakota and a very music centric family. Um, but that made me very lucky because I got into music at a very young age. In fact, I remember the first time I ever got up on stage and that was at age five years old. And it was one of my first memories of my life. And, um, I remember begging my parents at a certain point, like I wanted to get up on stage um, in preschool. I was asking to own my own microphone and to please let me be on the stage and please let me do the talent show and please let me do this and that. And so having that music teacher father was really handy because he made a deal with me early on. Um, when I was five, he said, if you learn the lyrics and you learn an entire song, and you work really hard and you practice, then I will let you sing on the high school recital that happened every year at the end of the school year. And that's exactly what I did. Now I'm going to date myself right off the bat because the song that I chose was Eternal Flame by the Bangles. If you remember that, lots of prom themes back in the uh, late 80s, middle 80s. This is kind of what it looked like. Oh my God. I said I was going to date myself right off the bat. I think I really date myself with this hairdo. Um, you can definitely tell it's it's the mid '80s, and <laughs> I had some sort of weird mullet going on. And so did my dad. If you see him in, in the other side of this picture, uh, he looked a little bit like Phil Collins there in my mind. Um, <laughs> So in this moment, uh, it was very life-changing. Um, I remember opening my mouth. I remember singing the song. I remember it being really bright and my stomach was doing cartwheels. And when I got done singing Eternal Flame, all I wanted to do was do it again and again and again and again and again. Like I was hooked from that point on. Um, so I lived my life for music from that moment on and uh, it was very exciting so my dad helped me take a lot of opportunities in the town and the county and I did a lot of um, fair type work county fair I did everything imaginable talent shows um, 
I actually sang at a rodeo one time. <laughs> so that's the kind of picture you can have of my growing up. Very rural, but very music centric. So when I was 18, I made a very bold move. Like I had been involved in all of the high school activities, choir, band. We did some traveling in that era. I actually started my own band when I was 15 years old and we called it Northern Comfort. And we played every single thing imaginable. We also would just set up in the park on Sundays and people would drop by and, and, and throw their tip in the bucket. So I knew that I really wanted to pursue this. And um, when I was 18, I was set to go to college where not only did my dad go to college, but my sister, my grandmother and my great grandmother, and they all had their music education degrees along with my grandmother having um, the all inclusive, she could teach K through 12 and teach music. So that's what I was set to do. But instead of doing that, I made a very bold move and I got in my 94 Ford Escort <laughs> And I drove to the big, big, big city of Minneapolis, um, the closest big city to Scranton, North Dakota. And, um, and I knew there was a lot of music opportunity for me here. And I knew that I was going to be able to follow my dreams a little bit more than kind of following in those footsteps. Uh, it wasn't easy. I really did disappoint my family. I think they were very um, worried about me not following what I was supposed to do and go to college and get my teaching degree and probably stay in North Dakota. But when I got to Minneapolis, I knew right away that it was the right decision. Um, I had so many opportunities in front of me. I started auditioning for everything possible, everything you could possibly do here, lots of theatrical stuff. And I had zero uh, acting training or dancing training, but I fearlessly went into it and, um, one of my first shows that I got hired in as a professional in the cities was Tony and Tina's wedding, downtown Minneapolis. If you remember that show, it was like an interactive wedding type show. And I played the wedding singer. So it was a perfect role for me. And I didn't, um, I didn't have too much acting I had to do, but it was very close to what I wanted to be doing. So that sort of spawned everything. I got a ton of opportunity from that. And I also, kept auditioning for things and um, and I kept some odd jobs along the way. And I actually um, did enroll in school and got my degree at the same time. So uh, it was scary. I was uh, completely culture shocked. I had never stopped at a stoplight before. Like, you know, there, we don't have that in my town. Um, I had never paid for parking. I always thought that was a weird concept I had never heard of. I, uh, I also rode like mass transportation, like riding the bus, and that was very different for me, but, but I adapted and I went headstrong into it, made a lot of mistakes, learned from those, and kept moving on with my life. So uh, things were going great. I actually, after my theatrical stint for about five years, I, um, I got brave enough to start my own band, and my own band was called... Scarlet Hayes. And what happened was very cool. We had recorded a few songs. We had gotten some awesome gigs in town. And uh, we were only together for about a year when I found an ad in the paper for a battle of the bands. And if you won the battle of the bands, then you got to open up for a sold out Bon Jovi concert, downtown Minneapolis, sold out Target Center, 20,000 people. And I took this opportunity to the rest of my band, which was only three other dudes. And, uh, and I said, we should do this. And they were like, you're crazy. You're, you're nuts. Like, we don't have the fan base. We, how are we going to get the votes? How are we going to be able to win this thing? And I finally convinced them to do it. And, um, and we ended up winning that battle of the bands. <laughs> so there we were, 11 months old as a band, and we got this giant opportunity and um it was it was nuts so when i talk about being five years old and being on stage for the first time and feeling my life change this happened again in that moment Twenty thousand people the lights went out people were screaming we got to meet john bon jovi by the way he's super super attractive he has a giant head because he has like little tiny legs and he was wearing like leather pants <laughs> And I will never forget it. He was so nice and so accommodating and 
was really interested in what we were up to as a band and, and just I'll never forget the day. It was uh, November 11th, 2005, 11, 11, which is my lucky thing every day. Uh, so I, in that moment, I remember thinking, all I want to do is that. Now that's what I want to do. Like I, my stomach was doing cartwheels and I was very nervous, but uh, it was a new level for us and for me. And I vowed that day to just keep doing that level of music and, and, and really giving ourselves a shot or myself a shot as a singer to really do this and, and be, become professional in that sense. And that's exactly what happened. The media really caught on to this story and um, we got infiltrated with opportunity. Uh, managers and and booking agents they all came looking at us and i had to make some really quick entrepreneurial decisions that i never thought i would have to do um but i used my gut and i made some really quick decisions as a business incorporated myself and um and went forward with an agent and a manager and eventually right down the road was our rec our first and only record deal that we had with that band. And I was having the time of my life. We were literally performing all around the nation, touring. Our songs were on the radio, which I can barely describe to you. I just know that it's a very emotional time when you hear yourself on the radio and like, that's a goal of yours. And you know, it's, it's everything. It feels like you've really made it or it just feels like another, you know, level of success. And that's what was happening. So we had toured for a couple of months and we were in the middle of what we call a press tour back in about 2006, seven. And uh, a press tour is funny. I'll explain that to you a little bit in my business in being a singer and having a band and doing that sort of thing. A press tour is when you have a song go to the radio and all of these radio stations start playing it then you go around to these radio stations and you do um, interviews and you do intimate fan meet and greets and you do, um, you know, shows for, for ticket winners. And then you usually have a big show in that town that night that the radio station sponsors. So we were in the middle of one of those about 15 days into it. And I started to feel really ill and I was like losing my voice. Now, I'm a singer, so my whole life has been centered around this machine right here. And um, when I get sick, it that is kind of the first thing that gets attacked because it's a highly used muscle in my life. And you know, when you get a cold, it's it's really hard on your throat. So it kind of felt like that, but I didn't feel sick in a sense. So I ended up canceling a couple of days of shows, which killed me on the inside because I, I hate canceling. I hate being that girl. And by day two, after drinking a lot of water and getting some rest, my voice wasn't returning. It wasn't coming back. And I knew something was wrong and different. So I was, thank God, only in like Wisconsin, a couple hours away from Minneapolis. So I, I came to Minneapolis for the day and I went to see my doctor and had a, an examination and I will never forget it. He um, stuck a camera down my throat, which is called a scope and, and my doctor gasped and I knew that that was not good. And he pulled the camera out and he said that, he said, you have a cyst on your left vocal cord, the size of your pinky nail. And which is very big when it comes to this little muscle in your, you know, vocal cord area. And I was shocked by the news. And he was like, um, the thing is, is that it's, it's, it's so big and it's multiplying very quickly. We're going to need to do emergency surgery. Like that's your only option at this point. I mean, you could let it go with no answers, but you're not, your voice isn't going to return. And what if it's cancer? What if it's something way more serious than just a collection of cells? So I remember that was on Monday, I believe. And, and I had surgery on Thursday and um, it was devastating. Right. I had to go back to the boys and say, Hey, the tour is over. I had to go to my record label and, and be like, I have to have vocal surgery. There's so many unanswered questions. I'm scared. And I literally went into early retirement really that week, like within 24 hours of finding out 
all of this stuff, everything stopped. And it was devastating. I really honestly had never felt that sort of situational depression. I had never felt so low in my entire life and very, very nervous about vocal surgery, right? It, it was my baby, my moneymaker. And you hear all these horror stories about people having vocal surgery and they, their voice never returns. And, you know, that it's just a completely different thing. So I went forward and, and I luckily had the support of, of my band and my family and my friends and um, just people around me. Thank God I had surrounded myself with like-minded people, with supportive people, with people that really rose up to the occasion and, and supported me, not only emotionally, but some even financially. And, um, and I had the surgery. So now, I mean, I can tell you after all of that, that yes, it was crazy and it was awful and all of those, those things, but it was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. It was one of the best things that could have ever happened in my life. And I didn't know that at the time, but what happened is I had to change my sights. I had to reframe my life. I had to adjust to what was going to be the new normal. And so what I did was I, um, with the help of my sister, I sat down and I made a list of all of the other things that I was interested in and, um, you know, what else I could do with my life besides music. Now, granted, that was pretty hard because I had lived my life for music since the age of five. But one of the first things that popped up on a list was, was kids, education, uh, music involving that, you know, and coming from a long line of teachers, I think that was very natural for me to sort of want to be in the education system somehow and influencing young minds. So I became a nanny. I saw an ad in the paper for a family that needed a nanny and they had five, five kids. And of course I didn't know what to do with one kid, let alone five, but I will show you one of the five kids that I got to be with on my time as a nanny. Let me see if I can share my screen. Hold on. This is Emma. And Emma in this picture was five years old, but I started nannying her when she was about three and a half years old. Uh, I can just, I can hear your virtual size of how cute she is. Those little brown eyes. And she uh, was just an amazing soul. And so were her brothers and sisters. Very creative, could sing and dance and, and they could draw. And <laughs> I mean, they were just a joy to be around. And I knew immediately that my life was going to change with this family. Um, they were very inspiring. And, um, and I immediately found purpose waking up every day. Um, the first day of work, I mean, I remember driving to Edina, Minnesota for, I lived in St. Paul at the time. And, and I just remember feeling like, this is it. This is, this is what I was meant to do. Maybe this was all the roads maybe led to this. Uh, so the kids were just a light in my life every single day. Emma was the youngest and she was the only one that was home at that time. The rest were in school. And so every day after school, we would do something creative together, whether that was, you know, making up a play or starting our own band or singing into spoons or making videos. It was, it was something that I, that I absolutely loved. And I'll never forget Emma every week was like, Kat, will you stay late? And will you watch TV with me? Will you stay late and watch TV, TV with me? So finally, on a Monday, I said, yes, I will stay late and I will watch TV with you as long as you are good all day and you listen to Nanny Cat. And so that night came around and the family came home and I said, hey, Emma has asked me to watch TV if you guys don't mind. And so we all sat down and I said, Emma, what are we going to watch? And Emma said, uh, well, I know you were a singer in your past life. <laughs> and so I would love it if you would watch this show called The Voice with me. And I was like, Great. Never had heard of it. Uh, never had seen an episode. Um, and so I asked her, I said, what is the show? And she said, well, it's where these singers, they, they sing and then there's people with their back turned and they try to get their, try to get their chair to turn around. I was like, great, let's watch it. So we watched The Voice for the first time together as a little family, extended family. And, um, and I loved it. I fell in love. I was hooked. Like it was such a great premise and so positive. And I had watched American Idol in previous years and I really didn't like how negative they got in the show. And, 
Anyway, we got way into it. So I pretty much stayed late every Monday and Tuesday to watch the show with these kids. And we had a blast. And um, we got so hooked that we would take like the swivel kitchen chairs <laughs> from the kitchen bar and we would take them into the living room and, and we would stand up on their fireplace, which looked like a stage. And we would sing for each other and then turn our chairs and become one another's coach. And um, I mean, it was so fun. I have so many vivid memories of taking out the spoons and <laughs> singing on the fireplace. And, uh, and we had, had so much fun with that, with that premise. So a couple months after that experience, Emma started school and I, it was bittersweet because I, I loved spending my days with her, especially and, um, and so I was bored and I, you know, would arrive to the job. I would get the kids off to school and then I would just kind of have some time before I ran errands or whatever. And I opened up my computer one day and there was an email that had come through my YouTube channel saying that it was a producer of NBC's The Voice and they had seen a video of me that, on YouTube that it went viral and they would like to have fly me out to California to audition for season six of their show. Now, of course, I was very skeptical. And um, honestly, I was frozen in fear at the very thought that this was real. However, I thought, nah, this is probably a scam. Somebody wants my money. What is this? I didn't know that they recruited for the show using the internet. Also, I didn't know I had a viral video on YouTube. So... I immediately went and looked for that. And sure enough, there was like a, a video of me. I had not posted it. It was a video of me singing in an airport in Amsterdam in my past life. <laughs> and it was a tour that we had done to support our troops. We had went, we flew all the way to the Middle East as a band. And we um, sang, we did a concert for our troops at, on a base in Doha, Qatar. And on our way back, there was a, a layover in Amsterdam and there was a piano in the airport. Now, I think it's even more funny because it was 6.30 in the morning. We were all jet lagged. We're coming back from the Middle East. Uh, the boys were egging me on to sing something, sing something. They can sit down at the piano and sing something. And I was like, no way. It's 6.30 in the morning. I'm really jet lagged. I'm really tired. And I'm pretty sure there's people sleeping all over this airport. I don't want to wake them up. I'm a loud singer. And so then they kept twisting my arm and twisting my arm. And there might have been a Heineken involved when um, I finally agreed to Kumbaya in the middle of the airport. And I did it. And uh, those three minutes changed my entire life now. I didn't know it at the time, but somebody had recorded it, put it up on YouTube, tagged me. And that's how they found me to audition for The Voice. So after doing all this research, finding the, the person who signed the email, finding out that they were a real uh, producer of the show, I was then faced with the reality that I was having one of the biggest opportunities of my life come through my email. And I honestly, like I said, I was frozen in fear, which made me not want anything to do with it. I honestly, I was like, I'm fine without music in my life. I'm fine. I love my life as a nanny. Um, I'm very comfortable. The very thought of jumping back into the industry to me was, was just absolutely crazy scary and risky. And, and I just was like, absolutely not. I'm not doing it. And I sat with that for an entire day. I never responded. I didn't do anything. And the kids came home from school. And of course, I couldn't keep my big mouth shut thank God. And I told all the kids what had happened. And Emma, with her big brown eyes, as, as I showed you, she looked up at me and I knew she could just see the fear and, and the questioning in my face. And we had a very special bond. And she said, Kat, why wouldn't you? <laughs> just like that. Why wouldn't you? And when I tell you that right now, I get the goosebumps up and down my spine because I knew in that moment, I knew when she looked at me and I knew when she said that, that it was something very powerful. And those words from a five-year-old, why wouldn't you, would forever change my life. Because honestly, I had no good answer, especially for a five-year-old and her brothers and older brothers and sisters. There was no way I was going to, you know, tell them I was too scared and, and have all this, you know, lack of self-confidence sort of 
come out to them. I really wanted to be a great role model for them. And I had been with them for a couple of years. So um, I, took, I took the opportunity. I jumped on a plane about three months later, not knowing what to expect, very, very scared, no answers, just knowing that I was getting on this plane and I was going to meet a producer on the other end of it and I was going to have this audition. Um, so very shortly after that, I was on Team Adam Levine. Do you know who he is? <laughs> Sexiest Man Alive 2013 actually um, was my year on The Voice when he got this very cool title of Sexiest Man Alive. And of course, he wouldn't, he would not let it go with Blake Shelton. And um, he really took this title as far as he could take it. <laughs> but Adam was an amazing man, is an amazing man. And I was lucky. I got a three chair turn. And on my season, it was Shakira, Usher, Blake, and Adam. And um, one of the last things one of the producers said to me before I auditioned, he, they said, it was, it was a she, she said, if more than one chair turns, try to remember who turns first if, because your mind might be going crazy and it's really hard to hear when they speak. And so um, all of that went through my mind when I got Usher, Shakira, and Adam to turn. And I was really mad at Blake. Like, why, why couldn't you just turn? <laughs> anyway, his team was full. There's a whole backstory there. And in the magic of TV editing, you don't really see that. But Blake's team was full because I didn't get to audition until the very end of the whole process on season six. And, um, and so I remembered that Adam turned first, but I also was able to sort of listen to them vie for my attention and get me on their team. And Adam was just a no brainer for me. And uh, he was just um, a, a light in the eye of, of my experience. If I, I, it's probably the number one question I get is like, is he really hot in person or is he short? So let me just give you this sidebar right now. He's 6'2", he's much taller than you'd think, and he's super hot in person. He's like super symmetrical in person. And I don't know how to describe it, but he's, and he smells really good. He smells great. <laughs> anyway, the day that I chose him to be my coach was life-changing, and he honestly taught me so much, right? So if you watch The Voice and you know anything about any sort of reality show with coaches, on The Voice... Um, the coaches get involved very personally with each contestant and what they do, what you see on TV is they take them from zero to 60 and they um, give them voice lessons. They help choose the right songs, right? They just sort of guide you in the process. And that's exactly what he did, right? He definitely did that. And that's what he get pays the big, big bucks to do. But what I did not expect is that Adam would go way above and beyond for me. Um, I really got to know him as a real human being without the cameras and, you know, spent some time backstage. He was kind of a loiterer. He like loitered backstage. And so I would just like go stand beside him and ask him my weekly questions. And, um, and so he ended up really mentoring me way beyond that show. And what he did for me was he really helped me define that word fearless in my life. Um, so today, that's exactly what I want to try to do with you, is to give you the, the three most important things that I think of now when I think of being fearless and how that changed over the course of my life. And what I, my hope is that I will spawn something in you to sort of redefine that word in your life, especially right now during COVID and during all of this time where we may, may be reframing our lives and reimagining what's about to happen and not really knowing the future and having all these questions. And what I want to do is have you walk away today with something that you can just take right with you and, and make the word fearless your very own. So let's jump right in. I want to start with what I call the three C's of living fearlessly. And that is courage, conquer, and commend. The three C's of living fearlessly. Honestly, the equation with these three C's in my life, I use every single day to some extent. But every time that I set a new goal in my life, every time I have an opportunity come up, I think of these three C's. And if I didn't do that, I may 
feel very lost when it came, when it comes to setting goals or conquering something that you want to do or doing something new in your life or honestly just getting through the day when it comes to COVID and all of the different things we're experiencing right now. So let's go right to courage. I love that word in the first place. And my subtitle under there being be brave. Uh, here's the deal. Here's what I know. I know that every single one of us on this webinar right now has experienced a time where uh, we felt frozen in what we think is fear. Uh, every single one of us has probably had an opportunity come up and maybe have passed it by because it, it seemed too risky or um, it, it felt like we were just absolutely frozen in, in the fact that we didn't want to face something that felt risky or face something that actually made sense in our lives. And honestly, I, I come across it a lot. And I just have to think to myself, where's the courage? How do I just simply be brave? How do I make the opportunities that make sense in my life seem easy, seem like it's something that I can actually do, right? How can we try new things that we've never done or reframe our lives, especially right now, and feel really confident about that choice and finding that, that just deep down courage that sometimes it takes. Part of being brave is accepting failure. And as much as I hate that word, I feel like I have to talk about it when I talk, when I talk about being brave. Uh, because a lot of you might think living fearlessly means you know, total success and, and like in meeting all your goals and, and making everything look easy. But the only reason why fearless works and being brave works in that, in being fearless is that sometimes you fail and sometimes you don't get to have what you really wanted. And sometimes the, the goal just doesn't happen. And you, what you have to do is learn from that, right? If I hadn't readjusted my sights every time I failed, I would have never gotten to the goal and success that I really have at this point. So part of that being brave is sometimes failing and sometimes not having that outcome that you want. But remember, first and foremost, when it comes to being brave, that's how you grow. And you learn from those mistakes and you learn from the things that don't go right. I'm not standing here because everything went right. I'm standing here because most things actually went wrong, especially in my business. Over half the things went wrong. Over half the things didn't happen. So we have to learn from that, grow from that, and that's how we become brave like that. And that's what got me to that point that you just saw, to be able to step up there and do it and accept in that moment that I might not get a chair turned and that it might not happen, but being happy that I was there, being happy that I took that risk, and being happy that I um, was stepping outside of my comfort zone. So I'll tell you the feeling in those moments are very, um, every week that I had to get up on that stage was very similar. It was, it was a lot of what I thought was fear and it was a lot of nerves and shaking and barely being able to execute what I wanted to execute. So one of the things I asked Adam was, how do I, how do I overcome this? How do I make it easier every single week? How do I have the confidence? And he said something very valuable to me that I want to pass on to you because when it comes to being brave, this is the number one thing I, thing I think of. He says to me, sometimes everything you ever want is on the other side of fear. Sometimes everything you want is on the other side of fear. So take that step on, uh, over that line of fear and see what's on the other side of it. And I'll tell you from experience, there's a whole lot of success and a whole lot of experience that I never thought I would had without stepping over that line of fear. Also, a secondary part of that, I had a lot of people on this side of fear to help support me through that and hold me up while I took that giant step. Now, I'm gonna change it for you a little bit. Thank you, Adam, but I really want us to step back and define what fear is because this also might help you in your courageous journey, in that being brave journey. Fear really probably isn't what you think it is. If you look it up in the dictionary, fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, or likely to cause pain or a threat, right? Fear is that thing that we are built with. It is an actual reaction. It's a fight or flight sort of thing. Um, I know that a lot of people are going through real fear right now with COVID. It's that unpleasant emotion 
because something is actually dangerous. You know, we might get sick if we leave our house. There's actual fear happening. And I want you to remember that because if we didn't have fear, then we might not be able to get ourselves out of situations where we actually need to have the, um, the reflex, the actual built-in thing for us to save our own lives. I'll tell you a short, quick story about fear on my own side. I told you when I first moved here, I was working odd jobs and I was working the overnight shift at a, at a motel. And I was 18 years old. And one night I got held up at gunpoint at my job. A guy just walked in. He looked totally normal khakis, polo. And he walked in and he said, give me all the money. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> I don't know why, because I clearly heard him. And then he took out a gun and he put me up at gunpoint and said, give me all the money. Now, in that moment, I can tell you that was real fear. That was the unpleasant emotion caused by something being dangerous. But I also am standing here today alive because I was able to act out of fear. I gave him the money. It wasn't mine. <laughs> it wasn't mine to begin with, right? So I gave him the money. It all happens. But I remember that actual feeling in that moment. And that, my friends, is what fear really is. So when it comes to us not taking the opportunities in front of us that are big or that seem scary or that maybe seem a little bit risky, but they make sense. What are we really talking about? After I read this book, the gift of fear, I knew exactly what we're now talking about because fear is that gift in our lives. So keep it there. But what we're really dealing with is something called doubt, right? Doubt. I know it's not a positive thing, right? It's the bad news is we're talking about doubt. But the great news about doubt, and it's kind of like fear's evil cousin, right? But one of the greatest things about doubt is that you are in 100% control of doubt in your life. You are not in control of fear. Fear is the reaction. Fear is a reflex. Fear is a gift. Doubt is something that we can control. So I'm going to change Adam Levine's statement for you today. And I want to say sometimes everything you ever want is on the other side of doubt. And so what we have to do is just step over that line. And I know sometimes it can feel like a wall. It can feel like it's a brick wall. It can feel like it's never ending, but you have to bust through that wall, kind of like the Kool-Aid man. And I want you to see what's on the other side. So be brave. Take the chances that make sense. Know that Failure might be a part of that, but the only way to grow is to make those mistakes and keep moving forward and pushing through that doubt. Be brave, have the courage. That's number one. Number two, conquer. I love this word. I'm a Capricorn, born in December. I love like making goals and I'm very competitive. And underneath conquer, I put my little subtitle, dream it, do it. Dream it, do it. Because that has been my motto my whole life actually it came from my parents when my parents would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say, I want to be a singer. And then they would say, great, if you can dream it, you can do it. Right. And then I had teachers that told me that my whole life. And that's actually my motto. I'm so serious about it. It's on my body as my 39th tattoo. <laughs> my poor mother I drug along with, and that was her first tattoo. And she was 60 years old in this picture. And my sister also got matching just to sort of commemorate my journey on The Voice and put my motto right in front of me every single day on my arm. And here's the deal. We're all dreamers. I've been a dreamer since I was a kid. And every single one of you on this webinar today, I'm sure, has dreamt, right? And we have all those great dreams and things that we want to do. But what I want to focus on in this conquer section of being fearless is to actually do. The dreaming is the easy part. The hard part is that do it part. So what happens when we have these crazy dreams? What happens when we have these goals? What happens when we have these great opportunities in our lives and we want to conquer it? We have to start with this very question. What would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? Now, listen, if you're answering that question in, in your mind right now, you're answering it with the things that you want the most. You're answering it with the things that bring the biggest smiles to your faces and the most joy. And so then what I want you to do is take out a piece of paper for reals and I want you to write it down. Because if you can see this opportunity, I want you to take it, right? That's the obvious part about conquering. But I want you to write something down in your journal because 
the hard part is if you don't see an opportunity that has to do with this goal, then you might need to make it. And I don't want you to forget that. Sometimes we have to make our own opportunities because sometimes it's not as black and white as having an opportunity right in front of you. So don't forget that you can do that. Now, once you start writing things down, I call it the dream, believe, take action plan. A dream written down with a date becomes that goal. It's just breaking it simply down, which I love this. And then that goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. So underneath that goal or dream that you write down, you can just break it down into steps, kind of like an actual um, like list, like a to-do list. And then that, don't forget that third one. If you back that plan by action, then all of those things will start coming true. And there's actual science behind writing down your goals, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, only three out of 100 adults do this. So if you're doing this, you're part of the elite. And I do this every day. I have five journals right next to me that I have filled up over the course of the last few years. And I want you to know this. As I did the research on writing things down and, and taking out a piece of paper and a pen, Forbes magazine says people with written down goals are 50% 50, 50 more likely to achieve them. Right? I don't know about you, but that's enough for me give this a shot. And it comes back to the Emma question. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you give us, give it a shot. You're 50% more likely to achieve it. If you just write it down. And I'll tell you what, in my Livia journey and my Livia experience as well, as much as I love that Livia app, there were so many things that I actually had to write down on a piece of paper because that for me connects my brain with my hand and that piece of paper and I was way more likely to achieve the thing that I had written down on a piece of paper. Just FYI, as much as I love the app and I still use that as well, this really works for me and it's old school science and I also love that. All right, so that was conquer. So now we have the courage, we're being brave. Now we are conquering our goals. We are asking ourselves, what would you do if you weren't afraid? We're writing these dreams and goals down. We're making that dream believe, take action plan. And now the third most important part of the fearless equation and to make all of this happen in a nice, beautiful, beautiful circle that will start right back over. This third part is most important and that is commend. And what I mean by that, especially us Midwesterners, I don't mean telling other people they're doing a great job. I mean, we already do that and keep doing that. Tell other people when they do great jobs, but I'm talking about taking the time to let yourself be proud. Let yourself enjoy the successes. Don't focus on the things that lacked. Although you should acknowledge the mistakes, but you should just squeeze by them as fast as you can after you learn from them and acknowledge the things that you do accomplish because then you can enjoy those successes. I'll tell you a quick story again before we go to q and I'll tell you that there was one night, there was like 4,000 people at my concert. It was insane. It was somewhere in Iowa. And people were singing the, song, the lyrics to my songs and having a great time and enjoying themselves. And I purely could, could just feel that I was doing my job. Like I was, I was entertaining them for the night and they were super into it and it was amazing. And then I went back to my hotel room that night and I started scrolling through Facebook. And of course I know better. And I saw all of these videos kind of come up and immediately I started thinking to myself, you know, Oh my goodness, why did you wear that? Oh my gosh, you, you screwed up the lyrics on that. Oh my goodness, why did you wear your hair like that? And I just started to cut myself down until I actually had to tell myself, stop, stop. I really, really, really honestly, great. If, if I didn't know the lyrics to a song, like I got it, I'll learn it. But I really wanted to enjoy what had just happened. And I could not do that if I went back into this weird focusing on the things that I was lacking. I really wanted to enjoy what had just happened and all the things that went right. So even if they all don't go right, I want you to enjoy the things that go right. Pat yourself on the back, enjoy those successes and commend yourself. All right, last little story. This was, this was a picture of my last week on The Voice and I ended up getting fourth place and there's five of us left that week. And I got home to Minnesota after a couple of days after this picture was taken and, and I was, I was getting stopped everywhere uh, at the gas station, at the mall. And, Oh my God, are you Cat Perkins? Oh my God, are you Cat Perkins? And it was this new normal that I had to adjust to, but so many 
fans came up to me to say, we supported you. We watched you every single week. We got our families together to watch you. And that meant so much to my soul. And I loved that. But then in the end, they would usually follow up with, but you should have won. (laughs) Or you got robbed, right? Or any of those things where I was like, you know what? (laughs) I really feel like I did win. I really accomplished what I wanted to. I wouldn't have changed a, a thing that happened on that show. None of the process, none of it. I would have changed nothing. Um, and sometimes it's not about getting first place. And that's where that commending yourself comes in and letting yourself be proud. Sometimes you just have to redefine winning and what winning is to you. Maybe it's not the trophy, but maybe you just set out to win the day. I'm a huge Vikings fan. And Mike Zimmer says that to the boys, to the Vikings, every single Sunday, he says, win the day, whatever that means to you, right? So acknowledge those things that go right, win the day, whatever that means. And of course, have fun doing it if you can, right? So let's recap real quick before we go to Q&A. You guys can put your question and and questions in that question and answer box for me, or you can type it on the side, however you're doing it today. And I will do that right after this, after I just recap real quick, courage, conquer, commend. The three C's to living fearlessly, which I hope you can take with you today. Remember, courage means being brave. Remember that it's not so much fear in our lives, but doubt. And we should keep fear where we need it in case we ever have to save our own lives, right? So everything you ever want might be on the other side of doubt. Will you fail? You just might. But if you learn from that, you will grow and you can keep moving your life forward and being brave and, and, and keeping that cycle going of trying new things and taking the risks that make sense. Conquer, write your goals down. What would you do if you weren't afraid? It's the first line of my song, Fearless. It's very important to me. It's a very important question. You're gonna answer those things with the things you want the most, then write your goals down. Dream, believe, take action. Step it out on a piece of paper, just like a to-do list, and you'll be really happy with those results. 50% more likely to, Get a goal accomplished if you write it down. And then commend. We just talked about it. Let yourself be proud. Enjoy the things that go right. And if you start doing all of that, you will roll right back around to being even more brave and having more courage, conquering more goals, enjoying the successes, and then back to courage. So I hope you guys loved my three C's to being fearless. I hope you can incorporate it to many different parts of your life. Um, Honestly, this works for pretty much everything in my life and it's worked in my Livia journey as well to, to uh, lose weight. So I would like to, and stay healthy, by the way. It's not just about losing weight. It's about like staying healthy for me and, and keep living healthy, especially when I get back at it and being on the road and traveling. All right, I would love to answer your questions if I can. I'm such a talker, so I feel bad. I, I go over time, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who tuned in today and listening to me. And I hope that you guys got something out of it. All right, here we go. Don't, don't confuse excitement for fear. Jane, this is a, that's a really cool statement. Don't confuse excitement for fear. That's exactly it, right? Because so sometimes when we have something in front of us, let's take my example for, for instance, when I got the opportunity to audition for The Voice. I think, honestly, because music meant so much to me in my life, And taking opportunities in music meant so much to me in my life that that feeling of being frozen was more excitement than anything, right? It certainly wasn't fear. Taking that opportunity wasn't going to be dangerous to my body. Um, But sometimes when you get excited or your heart starts to pound or you feel the cartwheels in your stomach, like I was telling you guys before, we do confuse that for fear. And sometimes it can be paralyzing But when we just talk ourselves into knowing what it really is, and if that's doubt or excitement, then we need to move toward the things that make us feel that way and not run away from them like sometimes we might want to. That's really good. Deb says, what was the most difficult part of your weight loss? Are you keeping busy with curbside concerts? The most difficult part of weight loss for me, once again, had to do with all of this. I think at first the doubt that I had in myself. I had never tried to lose weight. Um, And very quickly, I'll I'll say this to what happened to my body was that I I started to experience a a ton of health issues and most of them being 
female related. I actually had an emergency hysterectomy a couple years back and all of my hormones changed in my thirties and it was very hard on my body. And so I gained, you know, an extra, at least 30, 35 pounds. So when I was faced with that and having this amazing opportunity to come up with Livia, the most difficult part was just to try, you know, like move through the doubt and know that I might, fail and I was going to have to do it. Um, and then I'll tell you the second most difficult part was, was the fear of, of after the weight came off after the first 10 weeks was to go to my own food all day long and to meal prep by myself without having the comfort of the Livia meals and, you know, trying to get myself off of those. Um, but turns out, I'm not too bad at it and I really do love meal prepping and I love putting vegetables out and, and cutting things up and like it became very easy after the fear of, of, of it and that being the most difficult part. Curbside concerts, you guys, I'm still available. I am keeping okay busy, but I would love to be more busy. I have this beautiful truck that I, that I do concerts out of and I'll come to your driveway during COVID and, uh, or your backyard, however we can fit the truck in. And it's been really fun. So you can book right through my website, by the way. Thank you, Deb. All right. Eden Astrar says vocal training, where, who coaches you? Are you trained classically? Do you practice your vocals daily? Have you performed publicly for a long time? Do you seek success prior to action? All right. That's a lot. Let me try to get to it quick here. Vocal training. I, um, I took 11 years of classical training, 11 years of like opera training. So I did that mainly in North Dakota. Um, now today to this day, I still train with the vocal trainer that I had on the voice, which is a super secret that nobody talks about. There's an actual voice coach behind the scenes on the voice. So it's not just Adam giving you the voice lessons. There's a woman named Trelawney. And she has an assistant also, so I still do vocal training with them. And then um, one of the background singers, Stevie Mackey, who was on the show, is like a vocal trainer to a lot of famous people. He's also given me some um, training since my time on the show. So that's who coaches me, and I do it all via Zoom and via FaceTime and Skype, by the way, and it's really cool. It's awesome technology. So classically trained, do I practice my vocals daily? I absolutely do. I have a vocal warm up that I try to do every day as I wake up and sort of get my voice warmed up because I use it so much and especially talking, it's very hard on it. So I practice daily, I sing in the car, um, but I have a kind of a regiment that I do just like anybody would do like lifting weights as a bodybuilder or keeping that muscle strong is the whole idea. Have you performed publicly for a long time? Yeah, I, professionally since I was 15, but full-time professionally since, I mean, I guess nannying. So six years now, but so on and off, but it's been, you know, it's, it's a struggle to keep that going and put food on the table and make ends meet. But I keep that on my goals list so that I try to just really remain a professional singer and keep that my source of income. Do you see success prior to action? Not really. I would say my dream believe take action. I, you, I have to take action every time I want success or want to accomplish something. Um, so it's really important to not just have these ideas, but to actually do and take action and remember to do instead of just dream. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to me. I hope you got something out of it. I feel like I gave a lot of information in one hour and of course I love to talk. So Go to my website, catperkins.com. I hope all of you are having an amazing journey, not only during COVID, um, but hopefully in your Livia journey and, uh, and you're finding some success and health in that. You know, I, I'm, I cannot say enough how astonished I am that Livia not only help, helped me weight, lose weight, but it really honestly supports my every single day and week. And, um, and you know, I just it has made a difference in the way that I live. It has made a difference in my choices. It has made a difference on how I, how I attack everything in my life because I feel healthy and I get sleep and I can sleep because I'm not in pain and I can take my walks. Um, so I hope Livia can make a difference for you as well. And, um, and I hope that you find that, you know, that your life changes when you can 
take some of that weight off and feel healthy and start getting into an amazing routine in your health and wellness journey. And always remember that everyone at Livia has your back. I mean, honest, I have been lifted up so many times in so, so many different ways. Um, if you, you know, have a question, if suddenly you're stuck in a rural town and you're not, you're not sure you're going to make a really great food choice, they can step you through it. They will take your calls. Of course, they love meeting with you every single week to give you um, their guidance and they're the ones to do it, man. Registered dietitians and nutritionists, like it's awesome. It's awesome to know that they have so much knowledge and that they have um, your back. So thanks again, you guys. And go to my website, catperkins.com. I would love to come to your curbside if anybody wants a concert. And um, we're probably going to be doing that for Christmas too. So if you want me to come carol at your house. I'm open to it. I'll put on my ski gear. I'll be fine. I've got hand warmers. All right. Love you guys. Thank you so much for listening and hope you have a great day.